Well, would you look at that? It's a new episode of Headline This. What are you going to tell me, Lauren Bacall? Call, call, call. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. Prepare to be astonished. Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Headline This. I am Stephen Radford, your host. And yes, this is a comeback episode. It seems as though every episode is a comeback episode, but this one, this one's for real. Um, <laughs> welcome. It is, um, it has been over, uh, it's, I'd say a little over a half a year since we had the last uh, podcast with Scotty McClue. We're hoping to make it more consistent. We had a lot of a lot of chaotic things going on this year. Oh, hang on a second. Hang on, I've got a message coming through. Somebody on Twitter wants to give me a soundbite from my podcast. M- Meredith, oh, this is incredible. Meredith Salinger from the journey of Natty Gan, Lake Placid. Oh my gosh, she wants to give me a, a soundbite from my podcast. This is so exciting. Let's. Shall we, shall we cue it up? Let's play it. Okay. Stephen P. Radford. Stephen P. Radford. How do I know you? Let me have a look. Nope, I don't know you. Wow. She doesn't know me. So uh, let's get back to the uh, show. That was very, uh, very humbling. <laughs> So yeah, we're back, and um, for this episode, I'm talking to Valerie Lopez, who comes under many of her pseudonyms, uh, including Super Meowy. That's her social media pseudonym, and Natalie, which is her um, her personality pseudonym for the Radio Tata show. Now, I've known Valerie for a little over a year. We we kind of we, we've been ardent ardent followers of Dave Hill. I think that's okay to say. Um, we're not fanatical at all. We're not that into him. He's, you know, we can take him or leave him. Really, no, we can't. We, we, we absolutely adore Dave Hill. We, we've both been fans of his podcast, his radio show, his music, and his comedy. Um, anything else that he doesn't do? I believe he has a cooking show coming up soon. I can't wait for that. But, um, yeah, we've, we've been fans and we kind of got in contact with each other on social media and it, and it hasn't been the same since. So, finally, I had an opportunity to speak to her and uh, to talk to her about her comedy. She is also a stand-up comedian in uh, the uh, area of Austin, Texas. And she also is the host of two... Well, she's a host of Comedy Wham! Uh, which is an interview podcast, pod, bod, podcast. Yeah, that's about the body, everybody. Podcast. Yeah, I don't know how that works. She she hosts the Comedy Wham podcast as well as a co-host of Radio Tata's podcast, which is also uh, uh, with Lola and Natalie. Um, that's her pseudonym, Natalie, uh, which I I have listened to and contributed various pieces to in the last um, few months big fan of that show very entertaining um so let's go to it it's a fun conversation really enjoyed this here we go so i am speaking to valerie lopez today um for headline this and uh, valerie lopez is a podcast host of comedy wham right over there in austin and uh, she also hosts, co-hosts with Lala as Natalie and Lala for Radio Tata's um, very funny show. Both um, both Comedy Wham. I think Comedy Wham is just is one of those grounded interview shows that that brings all of Austin's best comics and beyond um, into one place. And it has been heralded 
as one of the smartest and funniest podcasts coming out of Austin. So go there, have a look at the Comedy Wham! and also Radio Tatas, which is, um, is a show that I'm more familiar with. I get to listen to that every so often when I compile them for a, for a, for a weekend of laughs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a hilarious show, and you will absolutely adore these two. They are just fantastic to have a good team. And, of course, uh, Valerie Lopez is also um, right in the heart of the comedy world there in Austin and uh, has been making huge strides lately in the comedy world herself, getting on the comedy circuit. I have to say I've listened to her stuff and uh, she's going places. Couldn't be more happier right now than to, to welcome you to the, um, to the show. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> who am I talking about? No. <laughs> That was um, that was so kind and generous. It's uh, it's, it's deserved. I mean, um, there's <laughs> there's you are prolific. You I mean you you do the podcasts. You also do the comedy. I mean, I don't think you ever ever not at a comedy show or um, yeah. events. So yeah, you live and breathe this stuff. It's uh, it's clear well, to see. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was that was extraordinarily kind of you to say all of those things. Um, yeah, I think I don't like to stop. Basically, I just can't can't do nothing. That's it. So I, I like to fill my time, and what better thing to fill my time with than comedy? Exactly. It's one of those things I've never actually ventured. Well, I have. I've tr- I've tried. I've done a, a couple of uh, uh, of terrifying um, performances in front of bar personnel, and mm-hmm. and, and it, it was kind of like, <laughs> eh, not too sure. I think I'm more of a storyteller. Yeah. So let's just get yeah. some origin here. Um, are you, okay. You, are you from Austin originally? I'm not. I was actually born in Belgium, and when I was seven, I moved to Texas because my dad is from Texas, mm-hmm. and. Uh, He uprooted my mom and I, who my mom had been a native Belgian uh, for her entire life. And we settled in North Texas in a small, conservative, undiverse town. And that had uh, some of its, its own interesting challenges. But I went to school at the University of Texas at Austin. And in those four years of college, I fell in love with Austin. It was just the most amazing experience because I got to see people of all colors, of all political persuasions, of all interests. And I just loved that whole melting pot concept. And Unfortunately, when I graduated, I couldn't get a job in Austin, so I moved away, then moved further away, then moved further away, until finally uh, I got a job offer in Austin about, I guess now it's about 10 years ago, and did everything in my will to, to, to uh, convince my, my family at the time to move, move back here to mm-hmm. Austin and have just been so happy to be here and I've since since gotten a different family have since gotten a different job and I've just I, I I feel bad that at the time I didn't know what a what a rich comedy scene Austin was when I was in college I only knew it for the music mm, and yeah. the, the the bar scene but since since coming back and about five years ago, I threw myself into watching a ton of comedy all the time. It actually uh, was a therapeutic thing for me because I was going through a divorce Mm -hmm. and it was part of my, well, who am I? What do I enjoy? What are my interests? And it turned turns out that comedy has always been there for me. Uh, I grew up watching Saturday, Saturday night live and, I haven't looked back since. And it just it just opened all those doors for you, and uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 quite an incredible thing to to get into as well. Quite a terrifying thing to begin with, I can imagine. Well, I mean, watching it is the easiest thing on earth. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't want to go out and laugh? And I didn't know at the time that I would become such an addict. I pretty much sat as an audience member for three years. Uh, of of watching local comedy, the comics that come through Austin. We have mm-hmm. we have a great 
uh, we have a big club in town called Cap City Comedy Club, and it brings a lot of the national touring acts. Yeah. And then we have yeah. a smaller, smaller club, the Velveeta Room, which brings in smaller touring acts. And just because I say smaller touring acts, these are still widely recognized names. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, in order to support those kinds of clubs, you also have to have local people that assist with those shows. You have a host, which is usually somebody from the local scene. Sometimes you have a feature act from the local scene. And so I think those two clubs were a driving force in helping build the scene. And there's, you know, there's just comedy is free a lot of times. So, I mean, who doesn't like to laugh and not spend anything and only have to pay for beer or margaritas? Austin is just a fantastic scene. It's always interesting. Uh, We have a few. Well, we have one big comedy festival that comes through town in the spring, and then we have some smaller comedy festivals. And it's always fun to hear yeah. those comics who've never been to Austin just fall in love with it, and then you see them come back again and again. And I just, I love that. I That's just, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, here, here in Manchester, I mean, we're, we're kind of like on the edge. Uh, anybody who comes to Manchester, they either do an arena or they do a, a smaller venue, and it's and it's it's just a stopping point on a, on a large tour. Nobody nobody likes yeah. to stop here for very long. So, uh, um, but and arena shows are weird. Have you been to an arena comedy show? I have not. No, and I I don't know about. Uh, I'm not very good with with masses of people. I find I yeah. find those places a little bit. I like to be in an intimate setting, um, and mm-hmm. I, I I prefer a smaller audience. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I've, I think comedy is a very to, personal thing, I think. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's it's really, you know, I guess the, the people that can book those large arena shows, they, they are the master of their craft and they've, they've earned the popularity to yeah. be able to do those types of shows. But, man, I sure would rather see them in a small club yeah. and just be wowed by them. That's it. It's it's almost as if the show is for you, and I think, um, mm-hmm. like like you say, I mean, comedy is very therapeutic. And if um, mm-hmm. if I'm just surrounded by thousands of people, and uh, I don't know, it, it kind of takes the, it takes that therapy away from it from it all. So, uh, mm-hmm. but um, so let's get to the beginning of your stand up. The whole idea of of getting up there for the first time do you remember that time do you remember that um that set that you did what was it um it wasn't a comedy club i'm guessing it was probably an open mic oh gosh <laughs> yes <laughs> they well, don't they don't I, just let I, you up there and just say i'll oh, go for it there's a mic <laughs> steven as a fellow interviewer i have to tell you that i would never think to start at this point because i, I had no intention of starting to i had no intention of doing stand up mm. uh, until this past January, I think my my role, uh, the hobby that I had settled into was podcasting. Of course. Uh, you, you mentioned Radio Tatas, which we're about to hit our three-year anniversary. And it's been, you know, that has been where I have expressed my comedy. But I would never, I wouldn't call myself a comic just because mm. I do a funny podcast. And then... A year and a half into doing Radio Tatas, I had just grown to love the Austin comics so much, and we had decided that we were not, we were, we didn't want to become an interview podcast. Mm-hmm. And it just so happened that a friend of ours was doing a, a he managed a website that was articles only in comedywham.com, and I said, hey, you know. I, I've got this itch to scratch. I'd really like to interview comics that I've gotten to know here in the scene. And he said, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And he, I mean, he, he just let me run with it. So I started mm-hmm. the comedy podcast, the Comedy Wham, which is an, it's a traditional interview. It's not, I mean, there are funny elements, but it is not intended to be a yuck, yuck. No, it's, uh, it's grounded. It's show. interviews and it's just uh, natural rather than trying to put on a... <laughs> On a, on a funny yeah. show. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, but it's, so, but it's so, great to hear that. It's, uh, not many people can actually do that successfully. And I think you're one of the, that's one of the shows I do listen to that, that does uh, take, takes a comic who naturally they want to be funny a lot of the time 
and they're mm-hmm. able to just relax and just talk about about life yeah. and about their approach to the whole um, to the whole craft. Yeah, and the whole thing started off as I'm a fan of comedy, and I mm. want to know, you know, what's your what's your background? You know, what what's your what's your origin story? Yeah, and what are the, some of the things that scare you or that you love? And mm. uh, you know, it, it started as as that, and I just I, I never thought that I was doing those interviews because one day I wanted to do stand up. It just mm-hmm. never crossed my mind. And I will tell you, and I have I've actually never told the person whose show that I watched that actually flipped a switch for me. Because mm-hmm. I'm just waiting for the right moment to tell her what an influence she's been. She um uh, uh, an astute detective might figure it out, but she she was a past guest, mm-hmm. and I've just loved her work. And I was sitting in one of her shows back in January of 2017, and I watched her. And it was a it was a room, it was in a coffee house, and it was not a show that I'd gone to see very often. But I've seen her a lot mm-hmm. of times and I just adored her performance style and she was bombing and she wasn't bombing. The room wasn't having her. Yeah. Like it was just a very cold reception mm-hmm. and I'm the only one like just losing my shit on laughter. I mean, I just, everything she's saying I'm laughing hysterically about, but nobody else is. And it just, you know, it made me mad and I, I was driving home and I said, man, she is such an inspiration. She can just power through any situation, any room. And she is true to herself. And she's just really, really amazing in that way. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder if I, you know, I, I consider myself to be somewhat fearless. I wonder if I could write something. And on that drive home, I wrote my, I, in my head, I wrote my first joke and oh, wow. oh, yeah, over, over the weekend, I, I rewrote it and worked on it. And then I started memorizing it and I'm like, Hmm, well, maybe if I just add in a couple of things and I actually went to my Twitter feed to see if I had any funny tweets, I don't have that many funny tweets. Hmm. Uh, so I, I, uh, you know, found something and I thought, okay, well maybe, maybe I could, go do an open mic. And that's, that's how it all started. I had no intention, but I thought once I get, once I get a niche, I have to scratch it. Mm -hmm. If Mm -hmm. nothing else, just to know that, okay, I tried it and it worked or it didn't work. And you come from a family, you come from a background of up and go, you know, when you, when something (laughs) has got to happen, you've got to do it. So yeah, thanks mom. That's, that makes sense. That's my mom's genetic uh, influence for sure. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I I did my first open mic in January, mm-hmm. and then I told myself, well, you know what? I bet you by doing this, I'm going to learn a lot more about how to interview my mm-hmm. comedic friends, and I I feel like I've done better an interviewer over the last year because I've done stand up. Yes. And then it's it's just become this addictive thing. Like I mm-hmm. I love learning about the 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 community and uh the the comedic community here in town and how they interact with each other and the cliques, the cool kids, the not cool kids, the kids that are first, you know, that are coming up. It it's been interesting to watch from okay, I'm I'm taking a a look at who do I want to interview in the next few months. And then, you know, Oh, they're just starting out too. Ah, we have something in common, (laughs) you know, that kind of thing. When it comes down to doing the stand up, what, what was the one thing that, that, that could have broken the deal for you? What, what was your fear? Um, my fear was having people in the audience that I've interviewed judge me mm-hmm. and think, Oh, this moron. She thinks that because she's interviewed us for the last year that she could do this. Mm-hmm. And so for this first, uh, I'd say for the first few months, yeah. that was my biggest fear, which is not conventional. Most people, their biggest fear is, 
oh my God, nobody's going to laugh at me and, or, oh my gosh, I'm just, uh, I'm such a nervous wreck on stage. I'm not, you know, I don't know what to do with a mic. I don't know what to do with who do I look at. You know, mm-hmm. those things were not, not a my, my fears because I've actually, I grew up doing speech and debate and mm-hmm. I've been in Toastmasters for way too many years that, that, that helps. The, the elements, yeah, the elements of public speaking, I wasn't worried about. And the, the other thing that we we really haven't uh, talked about is I am older, and I think because I'm older and I've gone through some big life events, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, I don't care about the judgment of others. I just care about, okay, am I, I want to do this, it's a bucket list kind of thing, I just want to see if I can do it. So the, you know, I I much less care about being judged by other people. So in those, but in those first three months, I was caring about other people judging me. But but so, the, the, know, the people that you knew is more the the, the personal uh, take on that yeah. rather than than just anonymous people who wouldn't get you. I think yeah, like you say, you you matured to an to a sensibility that allows you to say, okay, strangers. You're, you're just strange to me. You don't need to. I don't mm-hmm. need your approval. But if you're there for me, then then that's a bonus. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, and, and then since then, I've I've gotten a lot more comfortable. I mm-hmm. you know I remember being being very. Uh, when when I would see somebody that I would recognize in the audience, you know, I I got to the point where like, oh my god, I can't believe you just watched me. I'm just trying this. I don't know. <laughs> and they were just like, "Oh, it's cool that you're doing it. You know, it's fun, and you know, just just keep keep at it." And it's, you know, I think the that's one thing about the Austin community that people ought to know, hmm. compared to what they hear about the L.A. comedy scene or the New York comedy scene. The Austin community is so supportive and nice. Like they they, you know, I'm sure all of the local comics think I'm just not that funny, and it's okay for them to think that. Uh, but they are so supportive of each other that, you know, yeah, they co- figure... Comedy is a very territorial thing. It's a kind of a... It's, um, it's not like music. Anybody can pick up an instrument and anybody can just walk around and play music and just and be, okay, that's just another person with a guitar. But yeah. another person with a microphone with, with, with funny opinions about the world, funny observations about the world, mm-hmm. um, it, it's more... Uh, especially with with a lot of comedy, it's about the the surrounding world uh, as it is happening now. Is a lot of relative things, and I, I can mm-hmm. imagine for for comedians, it, it's a, a, a fear of theirs for for somebody else to come along and and I don't know. It, it, but to, but to be able to have a community that actually allows you to grow and allows you to just keep going at it uh, and is accepting of that, it, it's it's seems quite rare. I can imagine for for comedy. It's not like music. It's, yeah, it's... yeah. I, I I don't know how rare it is because I don't live in some of the other towns. I I've the nice thing about comedy wham and keeping mm. at it for uh, we're we're almost at two years now is in actually getting interviews with not often yeah comics people that yeah. come come through for festivals or that are touring through and they're you know it's very rare that somebody says oh you know. No, I, you, uh, this, sorry, let me re- rephrase that. It is, it is rare that they tell me, yeah, LA is as brutal as you've heard, mm. or New York mm. is as brutal as, as you've heard. They'll tell me, you know what? I have found a little pocket of a community in these cities, these big yeah. cities, that is incredibly supportive. Um, yeah. And it's been great. So, you know, I think, I think anytime you're in a smaller town, you always imagine the big towns are intimidating and gruff mm. and, you know, it's, it's not unless you're there, you don't really you don't really know. And I think it's usually because the the headlines that you get out are, are out of those uh, scenes are usually the controversial, um, you know, stories about uh, comedians falling out with each other or or um, mm-hmm. material uh, supposedly even stolen or <laughs> that that kind of thing they they seem to uh, uh, shout louder than than the actual voice of community um yeah when it comes to the mainstream media it's very hard to to silence that and let the positive stuff 
come out a little bit stronger. So I can right. imagine I can imagine right. that that's where the intimidation comes from. It's 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 you know, it's the the big the big um, the big guns that, um, that that shoot the mouse off, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I, I think uh, deep down, like you say, there is a there is a heart to comedy, and I think there's a, there's a lot of support if if and you mm -hmm. just got to be in the right place for that. You got to be the right kind of yeah, person and, as well. Yeah. To, wa uh, you, to want you, that. It, yeah. Mm. And that's that's where I'm at. Is I don't know what I want, mm -hmm. and I think some people view that. There's definitely a a camp of experienced comics that have a complete disdain for the hobbyist mm -hmm. because they think that takes away from stage time from the person, you know, the 20-year-old mm -hmm. who is going to two and three open mics a night and really, really focused on making comedy their career. Mm -hmm. But from a practical perspective... I'm never going to compete with that person. Mm -hmm. That's just, I can't, I can't do two to three open mics a night. I'm a parent. I've got a full-time job and hobbyist is the only thing that I can do with comedy at this point. So I'm never going to compete with that person. And that person is going to get booked on shows way sooner than I ever could. And the, the only thing that gives me some solace in that is that, because I'm older and because I tend to talk about things that are my own experiences, maybe that's unique enough for somebody down the road that once I kind of uh, hone my, my skills that they'll think, oh, well, this would be an interesting and different voice than the, the uh, 20 year olds that I'm booking on here who are just talking about dating and smoking weed. Mm, yeah. So, you know, to to me there's a place there's a place for everybody at the table. That's it. And and I'm okay with with my place. And I think that that's a really big uh, that's the advantage that I have as the older person who's gone through stuff is I know my place. I'm not trying to displace the 20-year-old. But you're I also but you're also yeah, because you're also aware that comedy is is flexible. It doesn't have mm -hmm. an age. It really doesn't. I mean, I, I can't imagine yeah. that it's not like um, the actors in Hollywood who reach a certain age and then they only get certain roles. It, it, com comedy is comedy. And um, mm -hmm. um, the younger um, starter uppers will, like you say, they will have their own specific area. They won't touch right. upon the stuff that you talk about, and um, yeah. it, it, like nobody would ever touch the, touch the stuff that George Carlin was talking about, or yeah. you know, it's I'm a person who will stand there and think I'm terrified of actually getting up first. I think my nerves always get the better of mm. me before anything, um, mm -hmm. and uh, at least you've got that, um, you know, tucked away and and in place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well. is, is it is it in keep is it in place? Uh, I mean are, are there any any times where you do feel that your nerves do get the better of you? Have you um, I don't think they've they they've gotten the better of me. I look back at some of the mm -hmm. the 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 opportunities that I've gotten to do open mics, which is you know, let let's be really clear that that's where I'm at is Nobody's booking me. I'm just doing the open mics around town. And when I travel, I go do. I try to do open mics in other cities too. Um, but, but you have done a comedy I, club. You have done one. I of have. Those. Yes, yeah. I've done the, those two comedy clubs that I mentioned earlier. They mm. have open mic shows, and I've I've been able to do open mics at both of those. And the the Cap City open mic experience that I had the first time was it was what I imagine the first time you shoot up heroin and that rush that you get from a crowd that responds to you and easily laughs at you. Yeah. Uh, part And part of it is because the comics that have gone ahead of you have really warmed the crowd up. Uh, and part of it is that different, that different voice that I bring 
uh-huh. uh, the 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 old single mom um, in her forties angle that I bring. Um, you know, all of that, and just the choice of the jokes that I wrote mm, yeah. really was like a high in my in my experience. And you know that I was nervous before getting on stage there because I knew that was the big club and there were, that's a club that all of the great local comics, they show up in the back room and they come and watch their friends. And I was intimidated that, that a lot of, a lot of them would see, be seeing me for the first time. And it's, it's a big how vibe. It's a big step vibe to, mm-hmm. to kind of feel your yeah. way through. It's uh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. But uh... um, so I think most times I, 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 my nerves are, are before and they're for the, the reasons that, that I've now hammered on a couple of times as I'm intimidated about who might be in the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've been in, in a particular wormhole for the past few days because I did an open mic where I didn't get a single laugh until the very, very end of my set. Mm-hmm. And I could, I could deconstruct part of why and then I, I've just had to tell myself, well, I know that I have other stuff that makes people laugh throughout. So it's not that I'm incapable, but it's, and I think if I weren't older and more, more self-assured about who I am, I would think, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing. I'm going to hang it, hang it up. No more of this. This is, uh, my self-worth is too wrapped up in this. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it is. I, that's the benefit of having talked to all of these comics over all these interviews is I've watched them and listened to them talk about exactly those kinds of experiences. Yeah. And, you know, lo and behold, they're still sitting in front of me because they are excellent at what they do. So why should I let that one experience uh, change me? Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of, lot to do with ego. I think keeping that in check is, is vital and um, yeah yeah i think it's easier to do that when when you're a little bit more older a little bit more um understanding and a little more objective and and you're probably able to to look at what you do afterwards with a, mm-hmm. with a more of a sense of calm and less um less um emotion than, than yeah. actually just going oh my gosh that i did terrible i did terrible i'm never doing this again that's it where's yeah. where's the ice cream um, you know, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just a matter of just, you know, calming down and just going, okay, well, you know, I know this worked before and, mm-hmm. you know, and I think when you're, te- you probably do, uh, you like to test material as well out, you know, new material. And that's, that's always yeah. difficult. I, 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 you hear a lot about, um, you know, folks like Mark Maron, who, who does a lot of, um, material testing on audiences where he will just turn up to a small club and it mm-hmm. would be awful. It would, it would there would be no pace to it there'd be no no energy to it because he's just trying to figure out what what it is like and what these jokes are like in front of an audience and it's a free thing and he just he he can he can bomb as well and but yeah. the thing is you're allowed to bomb i'm an avid student of things yeah and so i love to study things and try to figure out how they work and mm-hmm. so now I'm much more in tune with, with how do you, how, what is the formula? Cause uh, one thing that hasn't come up is my background is math. So I, I've done a lot of studying and I love formulas. And while I'm not saying there is a formula to comedy and being an, an, a good comedian, there, there are certain formulas to, to, to how people are successful at what they do. And uh, now I don't just sit in a room as a fan of comedy. I sit in a room and I am listening to how somebody has written things, how they are pacing Mm -hmm. their performance. And I, it's a really weird position to be in because I'm trying to, to go watch comedy as a fan, but then also watch comedy as a student and figure out, you know, what is making their stuff work for them Mm -hmm. that I could pull off for myself? Because there's comedies, there's comics that there's no way I could replicate what they do. But if I, 
if I know, well, you know, that's the kind of comedy that I like to do. And what is it about the way they've delivered it that really works well that I might be able to do? And that, you know, you, you touched on the whole stealing material thing. Um, there's no topic that hasn't been covered by a million yeah, comics. Exactly. You know, it's, it's just the, the, the thing about it is being true to yourself and how, you know, something that makes you laugh is pretty much what you need to yeah. be a successful comic. And do you enjoy it? And um, I don't know where I, why I just rambled off. I think my, my point was that it's important to be a student of, of comedy, but don't let that, um, don't let what you see other people do take away from your own voice and what makes you laugh because what makes you laugh, the audience is going to laugh with you. Yeah, it's about how to kind of listen to yourself and realize, mm -hmm. mm, yeah. But was there an actual moment where you actually realized that there was that there was pacing involved? Because I, I think for me, for comedy, that the first time I ever actually heard um, actual pacing uh, for a delivery, for a punchline, for example, was with Wendy Liebman when she appeared in, on Letterman back in, I think it was 97. And mm. it, it it kind of stopped me in my tracks. It made me think, okay, this this isn't just standing up there and just reeling stuff off that's funny. It's, yeah, there's design to it, and there's there's a tip off point where you can change the way you say things or the way you don't say things that makes it funny. And and was there a moment for you uh, or a person that inspired that that made you think, wait a second, there is structure. Who was that person? Oh, boy. Well, I could trace to my early fondness of Stephen Wright, who I consider to be one of the masters of pacing. I was thinking of him. Um, I was actually thinking yeah. of him. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was going to mention him, but I, uh, I got to Wendy Liebman first. But oh, go, go on. And, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I remember just his his comedy was always one of my he always stood out as one of my favorite comics, but I wouldn't, I don't know that I would have ascribed it to his pacing, but you know, there's, there's undoubtable pacing with what he does. It's not just his brilliant writing. It's that delivery uh, for him. And I, I had an experience where I maybe about three or four months into me doing the, the open mics where I started to, started feeling a little more comfortable in, in asking some of the comics, you know, Hey, if, if you, if there's something that you, you know, any pointer that you want to give to me, I'd be more than, than happy to, to hear it. And I had one comic who said, uh, slow down because mm. with, with my Toastmasters training, I'm a good public speaker. And as a public speaker, your role is to present a lot of information you know, get, get things going at a quick pace. And, uh, he, when he said, slow down, I was like, Oh, mm. Oh, because what I'm doing is basically I've memorized my jokes and I just go through them like a speech. And yeah. that's not what comedy is. You're not telling them the words you're, you're giving. Yeah. There's, there's more to it. There's, yeah, Silences. you almost you have, you have, yeah you have to let the audience form a picture in their head because the the artful comic hmm. will let the audience build a picture in their head and then they can deliver a quick turn and it just the shock of oh this isn't the picture that you were building in my head holy cow I love the picture that you just gave me you know there that's the comedic. Uh, uh, effect that you're that you know comics are going for uh you know i i i started to experiment a lot more now with changing my pacing and it's really hard to do when you all of your experience and background is delivering a speech mm -hmm. uh so i've and now i i listen i went to, to two shows this weekend, uh, a friend of ours who had been in Austin, who had moved to LA and he came back to town to record an album and, and just watching how he paces his set. And then I 
uh, last night went to a show by an L.A. comic who was coming through Austin and his pacing. And, you know, it's like, you know, all, all of my my hesitation about going from speech delivery to actual joke delivery, like, okay, well, maybe, maybe I can look for ways to experiment with that so that I, so that I can be more comfortable. And controlling you know, as long the as you're yeah. controlling the delivery and figuring out, mm -hmm. you know, if you just pause long enough, if you leave the silence hanging out there and, and build up some suspense, some suspense. Lean, lean on words then, that, that, that are the, the linchpin of the joke that you, you don't, mm -hmm. even if it's not the, uh, even if it's not the punchline, there's, there's always like at the moment where you can just get them just, just leaning over the edge. And then you hit them, yeah. and, and it's things like that. It's a it's a it's a remarkable thing because I, I I think I I try and do the same thing. I've always done that with with film myself because I'm I'm come from a film or writing background. I always look at a, a film and deconstruct it. And I think you know I like mm -hmm. to like to try and do that with any visual meaning uh, medium now and stand up. You can just see people just tilting over the edge, and Stephen Wright does that mm -hmm. very much. So uh, yeah, it's it's. It's, it's, there's so much to it. It's not just getting up there and talking. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, we we uh, just lost at the time that we recorded this. Ralphie May died a couple of days ago, mm. and there's a lot mm. of people talking about him. And I was lucky; I got to see him at the Moon Tower Festival that came through town uh, earlier this year. And some friends uh, shared a video that he did where he did a comedy class. And comedy classes are a really funny thing to talk about. But uh, I watched this video. It was almost two hours long. So it was like watching a movie. And all you're doing is you're, you're watching Ralphie on a stage. Uh, it was at the comedy store. Louis C.K. is in the background because he's the one that wanted Ralphie to teach this class. Uh, mm -hmm. and, it, and this vid mm -hmm. video was recorded in 2007. And I watched the entire thing. And, you know, there are things, obviously, I'm very early on here. And there's a lot for me to learn. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot from watching that video. And I thought, you know, there's as long as you have an open mind about learning things and, and picking up on yes. on the things that you see yeah. other people do, then, you know, keep, keep at it. You know, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard. I think that's the struggle is there's no roadmap. There's no instruction guide that tells you if you follow this path, this is how you'll be successful. That's and that's it. universal. You know, that's not just about comedy. That's, you know, let's, Use your example, movie making. You know, there's no set path. No. Sure, you can go get a nice degree from from a place uh, that that has strength in in filmmaking, and then you can, you know, go work for Universal Studios. And then you're you're set for life. You know, there's there's just no set path. You make your own path. Yeah. And if you're if if success is based on you building your own path, well, how do you do that without Studying and learning other people's that's path, it. and and that's and if you love it that much, that's all you're going to be doing anyway is learning. Yeah, you know, and that's yeah, uh, that's an important takeaway I think for that. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, and, Ra Ralphie May, gosh, yeah, he was only forty-five. That's uh, yeah, that's very sad. Yeah, very sad. Yeah, 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 and you know, there's you could be cynical about his weight, and yeah, of course he he wasn't able to to treat himself the way he would need to have, you know, to give us more years of, of his brilliant comedy. And, and I watching him, I, I, I could tell you, I, I don't love his comedy. It's so filthy and raw and like, Oh, it's rough, yeah, but it, but it's, him. but he's it's good. Him. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I mean, we, we, we have, we have a comedian here. I, I don't think he's ever made it to the states because he is very regional and uh, he, he's a, a filthy comic beyond mm. you know mm. even <laughs> even I think I, I, he's too much he'd be too much for uh, for anybody that I know or that we know mutually his name was is Roy yeah. Brown he's been around forever and, he, and and it astonishes me because the kind of level that he goes he goes so low 
And I think uh-huh. that that guy, he cannot, he should not be working anymore. But people still go. People still see him in arenas. He is still massive. Um, but but yeah. it, it's just a different taste. It's a different. Uh, it's a different way of tackling the the, the issues of the yeah. world, a different different viewpoint, and I think that there's room for everybody. And uh, yeah, you started Radio Tatas before Comedy Wham, is that right? Three yeah, years, we started three years Radio ago. Tatas. Yeah, November 2015. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, 14. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, yes. we're almost three years. It's incredible. That's fantastic. <laughs> you gonna you gonna have anything for your um, three year anniversary? Or you got anything lined up? Live show. Oh man, if we do, we are not prepared for it. No, no. but maybe. <laughs> no, we. Yeah. Yeah, we did our second live show this summer, and uh, we think I think we can only handle once every every six or so months. It's a lot of work because we we don't take the you know the live shows for us. We want it to be a spectacle not just us sitting at the table recording each other. It's, no. We've tur- we just turned it into a big, big production number. And uh, so it takes a lot out of, out of us. You gotta uh, got um, you gotta be able to get Jodie Foster at a, at a moment's notice. And that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's important she, to make sure that she's ready. Right. Her <laughs> yeah. people are, are, are really hard to work with. So in order to book her, we usually do need uh, a lot of notice ahead of time. Uh, we've got to we've got to pay her in lotion. And, <laughs> lotion. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> oh, touchy subject. Gosh. Yeah. Doctor Lecter is very upset right now. <laughs> she's gonna be fine. I don't know. Jerry, she's, she's Jerry falls too much. She's calm down. She's she's curled up in a ball now. She's gonna be fine. She's taking out a protractor. Well, that's pretty good at doing this show on her own when. You leave town anyway. She's stabbing her face with a compass. She doesn't like pointy objects. I'm pretty surprised at this. This is, this is how traumatized she is by this secret withholding person thingy. I feel like this bit may have gone on a little too far, a little too long. Should we move on with the show? I can't, I can't imagine that Anthony Hopkins sends her lotion every Christmas for... Uh, <laughs> Oh, wouldn't that go, be funny? Clarice. I got a little bit of lotion for your basket. <laughs> well, Stephen, I'm glad that my Hannibal Lecter is uh, no worse than yours. <laughs> Mine's terrible. I don't. I don't do impressions. I mean, uh, I mean um, impressions are really in your in your own head. That it's amazing how I always think, "Wow, that that sounded good." So, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, impressions are. I mean, that's that's another comedy routine altogether yeah. i mean um but um you and lala tend to uh to slip into things and how did you two meet i mean how did you two get together the reason that we got together is we were fans of a local comedy show the dudley and bob with matt morning show mm-hmm. and there was another podcast that was a fan podcast and they would break down every week they would break down the, the previous week's dudley and bob with matt show And they decided after about a dozen episodes that they didn't want to do that anymore. And we had just been introduced, I think, in May or June of of 2014. And, Hmm. you know, Lala's very, very nice and very friendly and, and approachable. And so we started becoming friends and we started running this idea by each other of, hey, maybe we could we could do the the fan podcast. Mm-hmm. We we wouldn't mind doing a podcast together. Yeah, and so it started off as a fan podcast, and then after about a dozen episodes, we decided we didn't want to do a fan podcast anymore. So we fell into the format that we 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 we've had for probably a good two years, where we we have a discussion up front, and we then have benchmarks mm-hmm. and uh, among our our favorite benchmarks are uh, WTF. Are you listening to? I don't know if I can. Can I cuss on this? Yes, <laughs> on your, please your... <laughs> do. Cuss away. Uh, what the? F- <laughs> what the fuck are you listening <gasps> to? Whoa, whoa, and... whoa! Hang on. <laughs> you are fined one credit for a violation of the verbal. Oh, no. I can't. Standard regulations. Oh, I can't say that. Where's oh, the? Do- oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 oh, no. It's okay. Where's the? Do- <laughs> so, 
So what 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 the what the who? <laughs> yeah, uh, WTF are you listening to? Where we bring in recommendations of podcasts for our our audience, and then uh, trucker porn, which is mm. uh, something we heard about on the Dudley and Bob with Matt show. There was some audio that had been put together for for uh, truck drivers because they're on the road al- alone for you know days and nights and so this audio was supposed to be like porn for your ears Mm. and we thought oh wouldn't it be fun if we did trucker porn because we were we're very we were very strategic about it because we thought we we know that our girlfriends are probably going to listen to our podcast but we need guys to listen to our podcast (laughs) so we thought oh if we do trucker porn we'll get guys to listen to our podcast (laughs) So that's see, how that started. That really? Yeah. So, so <laughs> you just, just yeah. put, put those two words, truck and yeah. porn together. And then, yeah, yeah. You've got us. You've got us. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's true. So we, we script out this, this theater of the mind and mm. it's never truly porn. It's, it tends to be double entendres and just, you know, awkwardly, pornographic but not porn it's a carry so on there's, it's a carry on yeah yeah. It's, yeah 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 so uh the thing is over the you know we we followed that format for two years and then we have guests on from time to time in the last six months we each individually have gotten so busy with life and things mm. that the benchmarks are starting to fade away and for example, trucker porn, we'll only do it now if we really get an inspiration or a script idea or, you know, we have we have had some very, very gracious listeners who have submitted trucker porn scripts for us to read. And those are the best when, when our audience actually submits them for us. And they have been everything from somebody writes us a tweet and we turn hmm. it into a trucker porn. Or somebody has actually done for us a three-part series and their promises of more chapters to the series of scripts. And it's just, you know, we, we love it when our, when our audience submits them for us. It, 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 gives, the, you, it gives you and, and Lala a surprise as well because you don't always know what's coming and a challenge to, yeah. to put it on the air and to, to you know, that's, that's, that's the fun part, I think, is, is getting yeah. submissions. Look. look! No! Look! There's another camera on the ceiling. I'm sorry. The page <laughs> ran over and I got confused. I don't like two-sided print. I'll use this can of whipped cream to cover up the lens. Don't waste that. Use the dairy-free can over there. Wouldn't want to waste the good stuff. Wait! There's another camera on the headboard. Wow! That one's a 360-degree one. Have we covered all of the cameras? Who knows? And you know what? When this thing stops its rampage across America, I'm going to get out of this hotel room and complain to the driver. Do they even know we're still here? Listen, the truck is slowing down. You're right. It stopped. The driver just got out of his cabin. Wait a minute. We're still both naked. I know, and you know what? I I still kind of like it. Hold me. Wow. Oh my god. We're gonna maybe be murdered. That makes no sense. None whatsoever. Why was there a, there was a 360? Is that being brought up later? Uh, we don't know. Is that know. coming back later? We have no idea. These are being sent to us in, in piecemeal, so we don't yeah. know the whole story. You guys are very comfortable with your friendship. Uh, <laughs> if someone wrote an erotic thing where me and my podcasting partner had sex, I would not have read it on there. Oh. I like how a 360 degree camera was at a headboard. What's behind the headboard <laughs> that's worth filming? Let's tighten these up. <laughs> Thank you, Misty Queensway. This is like Snowpiercer, though. It's exciting. I know. I'm sweating with fear yeah. and excitement of what's going to happen next month when we get another. Yeah. When we finally do another show and. Do another script. Right. Stay tuned for episode four. They get out of the truck, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and so because some of our benchmarks have faded away and, and we'll still do the, the, the WTF are you listening to 
from time to time and have a discussion about it. But mm. um, we're now just really we we had a recent episode where we had no we had done no prep at all. But I've recently started binge watching Game of Thrones. You know, this <laughs> show has been on for like seven years now, and I'm just it, now getting hit really? to seven yeah. years. <laughs> Yeah, no. it started in 2011. Gosh. So close, close to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can't believe and, that. Yeah, so you're just getting into it now. Yeah, so I'm getting into it. So I, I just, I, I brought that up as a topic, and we started just riffing, and Lala, in her brilliance, she she mentioned, well, wouldn't it be funny if we uh, tried to make comparisons to of the Game of Thrones characters to 80s sitcom characters. Mm, yes. And we just went on and on about that. And we, it was the, one of the most ridiculous episodes. So there's this, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, do we just riff like that with no prep at all? Or do we bring in things from time to time? We're, you know, we're kind of in, in an evolutionary and we do, I think we do that every year at our anniversary. We just, we, we look, we, we turn introspective and decide what is it that we, that we want to do with, with our podcast. But as long as we can make each other laugh, which is, yeah. you know, that's the com- comedic principle is, can I make her laugh? And I mean, I'm, I'm the easiest to make laugh. Yeah, laugh laughter is so. contagious. It's gotta be, you know, <laughs> it's gotta work for you. Yeah. 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 Uh, we're kind of excited because we're, we, we saw something by South by Southwest, which is a big, big festival here in town mm-hmm. that covers music, comedy, film, uh, technology. And they, they put out a call for podcasters to submit to do a podcast, a live podcast Ooh. at South by Ooh. Southwest. So we're, we're going to submit to that. So we at least know that we we plan on sticking around at least through spring of 2018. <laughs> <laughs> you've got your own contracts written up till then. Yeah, you've we, actually, yeah. Your own, yeah, and you've got to make sure that you sign sign yourselves up for the next season. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, that's that's fun. And, <laughs> yeah. Because you mentioned that the, the trucker porn is your big pull in for for the male audience, but you also have the the um, testosterone injection, which yeah. Um, you know, you need to push for, for <laughs> submissions for that because they they can be quite funny, especially if they can record them themselves and se- send those in. Yeah, you know, um, it's yeah. like it's like li- little advice segments uh, from men in the in the world that are just doing the most mundane tasks usually, <laughs> or or <laughs> inside into into their their own thing. I, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's stuff like that, and uh, you know that that kind of always makes me. Um, but what, what's what's funnier is what's what's even what's even funnier is when you guys then have your take on it and then you you mm-hmm. dissect things after it's been done and and you you put your your hilarious spin on it and that's that's why we tune into it you know it's it's the um, yeah it's it's the riffing that you guys do the little inside jokes um, mm-hmm. you know and I think that that's that's gonna keep you in good stead for a long long time definitely yeah. And, um, you know, if I can listen while I'm at work doing mundane tasks, if I can uh-huh. sit there laughing, um, then that's that's a good shift. I get paid for that. I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is uh, thank yeah. you very much for uh, our, our one listener. <laughs> no, <laughs> we, ha- we have a few and it's kind of cool. Mm. We have a global audience. We have yeah. a listener in Finland. We have a listener in Australia. So oh, it's yes. it's pretty cool, yeah. Uh, to have people your your spin on on the Australia, I think bringing that in, and uh, that's almost like Dave Hill's <laughs> eye on Canada. You guys have a have uh-huh. a, an upside down eye on Australia, um, but yeah, because um, having lived there myself, there's there's stuff that you say, and I'm like, oh yeah, if only you guys knew, uh, <laughs> if only you guys knew. How how that would go down and it, and it's usually like it was pretty funny but um but yeah um the the whole spider thing you you girls are just yeah you're obsessed with the spiders <laughs> <laughs> but um 
but it's it's good. And and you found that episode of Pepper Pig, which is is has been our, yes. our viewing for for years now, and it's um it's not going yeah. away anytime soon. Yeah. But uh, oh yeah, the Austra- you should get some more Australians on anyway, because they're they're good to have on. And they mm-hmm. they have great accents, and it's. Uh, I was yes, actually, I was yes. actually going to start the whole conversation off in, with a with a bit of an accent then, but um, I thought no, you might get freaked out and think nah. No, no, you know, <laughs> you know what? I am so clueless. I probably wouldn't have noticed the difference between your natural accent, your natural British mm. accent, and the Australian accent. Like that a- would have been my. And what's crazy? It would have been funny to you. <laughs> what's crazy is that everybody, because I I grew up on Letterman and I grew up on a lot of American stuff. Americana has has always been in my my genes. It's just been what my mm-hmm. mother listened to, and um, everybody says I have either an Australian or an American accent over here. Mm. And yet when huh. I come when I speak to anybody in America, they just say, "Oh no, you're British. You're just British." But I can get away with with with. If people say, "Oh, so where are you from?" and I said, "What, what do you, what do you think I'm from?" I said, "I think you're from America, somewhere in, in the states." And, I said, and and I've only done, done it twice. I've pretended to be Australian to somebody once in a post office, and uh, and I've gotten away with the American <laughs> accent with somebody else in another shop. And uh, and sometimes if if they think that I'm from there, I like and I, I just think in my head, "Do I want to do this now?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and it, they seem to just it, it, it's like. I don't think I actually have a specific accent. I really don't, and I don't think. Oh, uh, interesting. And I don't think you do either. You're not. You're not like I say. You don't have a Texan accent. You put accent, but you don't. You're right. not. You're not Flemish either. You're not. Uh, you know. You don't have the uh, the Belgium. Um, do, you, do you speak Dutch? I don't. I I lived in the eastern part of of the country where I would have French, learned uh, Walloon. Well, I learned French. I do speak French, mm. but I would have learned Walloon. That would have been my dialect had oh. I uh, had I stayed there longer. Because we were my my grandmother was Walloon. She would you know sometimes drop in a phrase here or there, but yeah. Yeah, the, the, uh, the Dutch have some interesting phrases. I mean, every so often I bring something in, and I, while I was over there for five years, I made up my own phrases that they and they just said no, no, that's not a phrase. I said, well, it is now. It's great. You should. <laughs> it's what, one of them was um, um, sheep killing weather, as in just it's the kind of weather that can just <laughs> kill sheep. And so, so I went, het is schaap doden weer. Um, Bauter, it's uh, sheep killing weather outside, and they said, "No, no, no, that's not an f- expression." Try it. Go on, take it out and try it. It sounds great. Schap Dordenveer. Come on. But no, no, they they weren't impressed with my. Uh, no, I'm just trying to influence and and just bring their uh, language up a notch, you know. It's, <laughs> And, and that's probably why they told me to leave because I just I just wasn't taking the, the Dutch language seriously enough. I like the idea of sheep killing weather. Sheep that killing weather. That's just a visual. But, but that's it. That's a visual. I read that. I read that line. It was from uh, Charles Charles Fraser's um, Cold Mountain. Um, I think it was a line said by one of the characters in uh, the weather is so bad it's, it, it's, it's enough to kill a sheep or she may have actually said sheep killing weather. Tell me this, she said. A woman earlier said that it was sheep killing weather. Did she mean it was good weather for killing sheep or that this weather killed sheep? But yeah, schaap doden weer. It's, uh, it's something that uh, <laughs> needs to be injected into our uh, everyday <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm so amused by that because one of one of my roles on Radio Tata is, is to be mm. the one that that butchers phrases yeah. and just says the wrong thing. So I think I might have to introduce sheep killing weather to our well. To be, to be fair, I mean um, the <laughs> states have had enough sheep killing weather for for one season. I mean, uh, well, those, yeah, that's those. True. I mean, I mean to take it to I mean those episodes where La La's out there in Houston, um, you know, it, it was informative, and that's another thing that you guys do really well is is, you know, th- there is journalism in there when you are pushed, and um, and it and it's it was insightful and it was heartfelt, and I thought that those those episodes in particular, although a break from the comedy, they were mm-hmm. done very delicately, and um, and I think it was necessary definitely necessary to to have that perspective on both of you because it's um it's very heartfelt 
Yeah, we've we've definitely from time to time put on our pseudo journalist hats on. Mm. I can think of you know those episodes where we we do something that's more of a documentary have been they're very time consuming and they're very emotional for us. Mm. But we we like to to point you know people to them. We we did a whole episode on the warrior community, which is we mentioned that morning show that we're fans of. There's a whole community of people that were built as uh, that are the warriors of the Dudley and Bob with Matt show. And we did a, a whole, I think it was an hour and a half long uh, audio documentary of their origin and where they are today. And then uh, this past, over this past year, I, um, you know, did a, an episode dedicated to my dad, which was, you know, really emotional and powerful mm, experience yes. for me to go through. And um, I think, you know, I, I've gotten very kind words about that episode, but that was a very therapeutic thing for me. So I think along those lines, it's very mm. therapeutic for mm. Lala to talk about, you know, the, the, the destruction that Hurricane Harvey brought. And uh, from time to time, I know that when um, the Charlie Hebdo uh, incident happened a few years back. We spent a, an entire episode talking about, you know, the the impact of of gun violence. Yes. Uh, yeah. On on not only Paris but just society in general. So yeah, th- that's the 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 great thing about her as a co-host is we are we are simpatico not only in the things that make each other laugh but in the things that make us cry. Yes. And so we can have a really good conversation about the serious stuff just as much as we can have a good conversation about the goofy, dumb stuff. Yeah, and there's usually no transition between the two, and and that that's, that's yes. because and and it's and it's you make that all right, you make that okay to mm-hmm. to to be in one moment, and then I think there was a moment when when Lala was in uh, Houston where she said, "Well, well, how, how you know?" She said all this tough stuff going on there and all yeah. this awful stuff no she said so how was the comedy show going over yes. there and you were like and it was like it was just it's levity and the, the thing is yeah. that the, the duality of 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 difficult times in life and humor there is yeah. there's, there's a there's a path between the two that's very direct and necessary yeah. and i think that that's something that we have to always realize that that no matter how dark things are, there's always everything is sur- surrounded by light, and that yeah. light c- comes from from humor and uh, and it's real. And, yeah, and I it's... I always think about uh, Saturday Night Live was having its uh, season opener episode the week after nine eleven happened. Mm, yes, and everybody was just you know riveted and curious as to how are they going to handle this disaster that happened Hmm. right you know at their doorstep and yet try to be funny and i just remember it's it's like ingrained in my brain they had first responders all on stage they had rudy Hmm. giuliani was on stage and lauren michaels was on stage and uh the, the the comment was you know, they, they they broke the tension by Lauren saying, "Well, you know, you know, now we're we're going to try to be funny." And uh, Rudy, I think it was Rudy who said, "Well, why start now?" And it just broke <laughs> the tension beautifully. And it was like, yeah. you know, even in the in the in the face of dark events, comedy can you know? Let's go back. What what did I what did I say early on? Comedy was my therapy. Yes. Comedy can be therapeutic, and mm-hmm. so in that moment, you know, we all were were tense, and then we just relaxed because, oh yeah, that's a pretty funny, that's a pretty yeah. funny jab. That's a beautiful thing. Well, I, I, um, I'm going to wrap things up now. Is there are there any links that you'd like to throw out? Um, I think we've we've got some. Uh, uh, you've got you've got a whole bunch of sites to to. Oh uh, goodness, yes. Yes. Well, let's start what, with. What are you listening people... to? 
<laughs> listen to Radio Tatas, and you can listen to us on all of your podcasting platforms, and you can follow us on Twitter. Mm. Uh, we have a Facebook page as well that you can like, and we love hearing from listeners. So you know, drop us a, a, a tweet or a Facebook message. We we love hearing from people that listen to us. And then uh, Comedy Wham, the the traditional interview format. A podcast. We have a website, comedywham.com, where uh, while the the podcast interview is available on, on on the podcasting platforms, we take each interview and one of our team will do a write up. So it's not just a listen to in, with your ears, but do, take take a read through the write ups on comedywham.com for each of the comics, and uh, you know interact with us. We also have a Twitter and Facebook page for Comedy Wham, at Comedy Wham, and then if you, uh, you know, haven't had enough of my multiple personalities, or what I call <laughs> now my, my meow t- meow t- how did I don't know, I have this on my Twitter, you can follow personalities. me, yes, my meow personalities, I am at Super Meowy on Twitter, and, uh, you know, I've, I've got my insanity, because I have so many different factions of podcasting groups that mm-hmm. I'm a part of that I always imagine if, if somebody uh, listen, you know, looks at my Twitter feed and they happen to be in one faction and they see me go on a tear about something else, they must be like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> yeah, so, so many groups. So, so many, yeah, so many, so many groups, so many groups, so many groups, and shout out by the way, <laughs> you know, to to our our group of, of friends, the uh, the original seventy one homies, the Hill people of, of Dave Hill Monday night, the goddamn Dave Hill show. Make sure that that you listen to it. Absolutely, and that's on WFMU that's how, or WFMU. yeah, that's how you and I. That's right. It's from Mount Hoboken. We can we can memorize the whole thing, right? <laughs> um, if if I can put my mind to it, yeah, I think I ought to get it written down though, because uh, I like to impress people um, by knowing numbers. Two zero one two zero nine nine three six eight. That's two zero one two zero nine. Call them now. You never know; they might pick up. You know, call them anytime. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's how we we kind of met up. I mean, I I heard you. Yeah. I actually I did hear you, but didn't know who you were at the time when uh, when you had listener mail on Dave's old podcast on his yeah um, yeah. So uh, and uh, I was like super meow. I mean, God, who is that? What a dumb God. name. <laughs> what kind of a person calls himself super meow? Like, well, <laughs> but. Now it kind of all it kind of all makes sense, and that's <laughs> and you're just a you're just a whole I've got a whole picture of a, of a really amazing person, and that's uh, you know um, I I'm very very blessed to know you definitely in this capacity. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, likewise. We have likewise. fun. We have fun. We have fun. Yeah. So um, I I'd, I'd like to uh, get a shout out as well to uh, the Justin Smith. Who um, yeah. very graciously gave us art for a different podcast, um, which was the End of Things podcast. Um, um, we, we'll get to more episodes of that, I'm sure. But Justin Smith Art dot com. He's a he's an Austin um, local, I believe, isn't he? He is. I've met him live and in person, and he's great. His art is absolutely amazing. And definitely, it is the season because uh, Halloween is looming. Um, that's going to date this mm-hmm. podcast completely, but um, his art mm-hmm. is is so different, so unique. He's yeah. he's as much about the backgrounds as he is the foreground, and that's you know it's his unique spin on art that that keeps me going back to JustinSmithArt.com. dot com. And yes. um, of course, you can catch this episode at StephenRadford dot com. We are available on iTunes. It is headline this. You can search for that and by name Stephen Radford. Uh, that's with a PH, not a V, and Radford as in radical, Ford as in car. Yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, and, and I really didn't need to do that, but that's okay. Um, you can find me on Twitter <laughs> at Stephen P. Radford, um, at Stephen P. Radford. Um, I say terrible things to terrible presidents. And. Uh... <laughs> and um... What? I hadn't heard. 
No, no, no. It's been a, it's been a tricky year. Uh, <laughs> oh man. But um, that's also going to date the podcast. So thank you very much, Super Meowy, Valerie Lopez, uh, Natalie. Thank you very much yeah. for being a part of the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephen. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much for listening to that. That was Valerie Lopez. This has been Headline This. More to come. We've got some Halloween episodes coming up soon. You hold tight, and um, thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. Was that, was that not bad? Was that okay for a comeback episode? Should, should we have another comeback episode next week? Oh, you can't do it weekly. It's kind of... Okay. All right. Bye-bye. We all need that moment in our lives where we are reminded about who we are and what we are about. It can come to you as a taste, a feeling, but rarely does it become a place so tangible that it is life-changing. A place where the deadlines are made by the seasons and order thrives in the vastness of biodiversity. That place is Australia. Australia is a land where the urban culture is put in its place against a fortified landscape of beauty beyond comparison. A place that provides lessons within an unforgiving terrain. Desert, rocks, forest and coral, these are the custodians of a frontier that is crafted by evolution to an immense scale. The land is shaped impressively, as if still freshly touched by the stars that once created them. Visit Australia and see the many creatures that go their own way and yet live in harmony with each other as they encourage and influence the wisdom of Australia's people. Where else can life teach you about the challenge and reward, about trust, strength and the willingness to adapt and overcome? Find balance. Find yourself. Discover the ultimate destination. Australia.